positives of using Linux. All right, how's everyone tonight? Or today, oh, this morning. <laughs> it's, it's just a whole experience. How is everyone? Good? good? Just good? Hey, can you, can, oh, you got a mic. Yeah, 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 perfect. Okay. Today, I'll be presenting DAX, the evolution of DAOs. So just brief disclaimer, not legal advice. You know. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll be listing some token prices, so don't, don't, uh, don't be worried. Uh, who I am? My name is Pavel. I'm the integration lead at Meetis. And I'm, yep. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. I'm the in between for tech and business. So hopefully I can speak both languages today and educate every one of, of you on the benefits of DAOs and DACs as well. So today we're going to go over the past, the descriptions on DAOs, the alternatives to coin governance, as well as the decentralized autonomous corporation. Before we go into it, raise of hands, who here knows what a fork is? Okay, majority, not everyone. Well, this, this is a fork. So, <laughs> for those who didn't wait, raise their hands. No, what I want to specify is a fork in a blockchain. So just to go over the principles of a fork, we have Alice and Bob, two users in a blockchain. Alice has 50 tokens, Bob has 50 tokens, I, Bob then transfers 25 tokens to Alice, and Alice receives 25 tokens, and gets, Bob gets 25 tokens deducted from his balance. Now, in the next case, this is a double spend attack. Alice receives 25 tokens from Bob, but Bob doesn't get the 25 tokens deducted from his balance. So in this case, this is a double spend attack. This, you know, at, at a protocol level, this never happens unless it's like a 51% attack. But in this case, this is the wrong state. So what it makes sense to do is to do what is known as a fork. A fork that copies the correct state and makes a fork and a copy with the balances changed correctly. So in this case, Alice receives the 100 and Bob correctly gets 25 deducted from his balance. So why is this important? Well, let's look at the past or past examples of places where forks were used. So we're going to look, look at the history, very brief, of the DAO. The DAO was a big, fully autonomous crowdfunding platform, raised over $150 million, the biggest in the world. And with the biggest in the world, it had the largest downfall, where over 3 million ETH was unfortunately stolen from the protocol. There was three options that the entire Ethereum ecosystem had. Number one was no action. So in this case, I let the hacker keep the 3 million ETH and let it go on its business. And that's what ETH Classic is. There was another proposal, a soft fork. And what the soft fork did was that the investors would still have their 3, ETH, or 3 million ETH missing, but the hacker was prevented from using it. But this introduced some more vulnerabilities and some more you know, nuances and stuff. More discussion needed to be done. And in this case, the hard fork was chosen. The hard fork basically reverted history and said and gave the investors back the money. So hard fork was chosen by the majority of ETH holders. So in this case, take a look. Now, this is probably more like a, a degen look at things. But we look at the token price, and we see that the price of ETH is more than the price of ETH Classic because the protocol is being used more. Now let's take a look at Steam and Hive. Now Steam is a DPoS blockchain. Don't worry about DPoS, it's, uh, it's, it's a delegated proof of stake. But basically you have things called witnesses. Witnesses can produce blo blocks. And how they're voted in is they're voted in with tokens. What happened with Steam is that new witnesses were voted, a majority of token holders, and it came from centralized exchanges. So majority of witnesses were voted in using the tokens from those centralized exchanges. And some members of the Steam community didn't like this. They disagreed. So what did they do? They created Hive. Hive is a hard fork of Steam. And in this case, the accounts that participated in the centralization of Steam, they didn't get the airdrop tokens of Hive. So the results of the hard fork, again, another DGEN example. So Hive is being used more than Steam. 
What is the key lesson here in both instances? It's not the protocol that governs the community. It's the community itself. It's the community's choice of legitimacy. That's what wins. Now let's take a look at some just DAO's brief overview of that. So Koopa Troopa, highly recommend that you follow him. He's basically the, the guru on DAOs. He summarized things in very effective tweet. DAOs are internet communities with a shared capitalization table and a bank account. So in, in summary, it's like a Discord channel with a smart contract. And you know, everyone owns the funds and, and uh, it's, it's a whole process with that. Before I go into more explanation of DAOs, I want to describe my vision of decentralization. Now, everyone's is different. If you ask any different person, they, they'll, they'll give a different explanation. So in my case, the state of which an entity does not have the ability to influence the results of an action, even if that entity's sole goal is to influence that result. So in this case, if you pointed a gun to my head and you said, hey, revert this transaction, and I wouldn't be able to do it, that's decentralization. Moving forward, what problems does a DAO solve? Well, first, it's distributive. So what this means is that anybody with an internet connection can come in and connect and participate in a DAO. It's inclusive. It's not role-based or restrictive. Anyone can come in. Anyone can contribute. It's also multidisciplinary. So anybody with any range of skills can come in and participate, whether you're a developer, or a content creator, or produce articles. Anybody can come in, anybody can participate. And finally, you get incentives in the form of tokens, so you get rewarded for your contributions. There are certain problems with this mechanism. Some of the problems is first is that it's inefficient, and this more so has to do with the governance processes. So a lot of the things have to be done through a coin governance vote. Everyone has the right to vote, everyone has the right to propose different things. Now, of course, there are different things might require more attention. Different things might need to be processed faster. If there's, for example, a security vulnerability, how is that handled? Is it offset to the developers? Or is it offset to the community saying, hey, you know, here, here, here's a security thing, here's how you ex exploit it, and uh, you know, <laughs> we're gonna fix it in like three weeks. Uh, next is the voter apathy. So this is a problem not just for DAOs, this is a problem for all communities in general. So voter apathy is essentially the case where you know, I, I am, I am, uh, you know, I, I don't participate in the governance process. Either I'm not in, 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 engaged enough, or or whatever reason. But in this case, there needs to be a quorum, and sometimes it doesn't be, it, it's not met. And this was seen in the DAO as well. So there's not enough knowledge as well. So who gets to make the decisions that's key for the entire community? Who gets to hire the developers? Who gets to hire the the, the specific people that are working with the code? You know, is it the community decision, or is it more of the CTO and, and whatnot. There is an alternative to coin governance, and three alternatives. So first, I want to mention the power of the protocol. So again, it's not the protocol that governs the community, it's the community itself. So in this case, there's three alternatives. There's the removal of people. So essentially, you take away the governance, and you say, you know, we have a smart contract, and if you want to do anything, you can make changes to it, but it has to be a fork, and it's not related to that. Now, this is good if the protocol doesn't change, but typically in the whole advancing DeFi space, it's a lot of things change. A lot of things need to adapt to the environment that, that they're in. Another case is a slashing mechanism. So you stake your tokens, and you just hope that the, that the proposal gets passed, and in this case, you know, if it doesn't, then you lose the stake. Now, unfortunately, this does decrease the engagement as well, and what we want is more engagement. What we want is more effective decisions within the whole ecosystem as well. And there's a third, the inclusion of trust, which we'll explore further. The case for trust. So in Ethereum, there's a lot of you know, hierarchy of trust. I trust that, the, that ETH2 will eventually come out. Eventually, you know, it's, it, it'll, it'll take time. But I trust that everything is done by the book, and I trust that everything is managed by the Ethereum Foundation and all the related developers with that. I trust the Ethereum client developers. You know, Geth, Open Ethereum, uh, you have Ethereum. I trust that they've implemented their protocol successfully and they haven't introduced any type of vulnerabilities. If they do, they can actually, they say they can patch it and then notify you later once they fix it. I trust the contract developers. If I don't trust the contract developers, I trust the auditors for the contract developers. And then, you know, the whole ecosystem of trust, I can't go through all of the code and essentially pick out all the vulnerabilities. I, 
offload to more responsible people. I trust the miners and validators. Now, of course, this is based off of game theory and token rewards and whatnot. And I trust the users, the users that will use the protocol as well. So there's a whole hierarchy of trust that all, you know, it's like, it's like a big pyramid. Hmm. And in this case, I want to emphasize what the future of DAOs may look like. Now, by, there's a, a distributed autonomous corporation was defined by Stan Lorimer in 2013. So before Ethereum, before the Ethereum was inceptualized, it's, now this is a big paragraph I wanna just summarize. These rules are implemented as a publicly auditable open source software distributed across the computers of their stakeholders. So in this case, a smart contract. And this stock may entitle you to the share of its profits, participation in growth, and or say on how it's run. So you get basically tokens. A modern day translation of this is protocols that are based on smart contracts that use governance tokens. So in this case, almost all of these DAOs can be considered distributed autonomous corporations. Now this just seems wrong, right? I think that the definition needs a revitalization. So in this case, I took this from Ethereum, uh, from Vitalik's you know, blog post about DAOs, DAX, and just incomplete definitions guide. So I want to complete more of so of the definition of a DAC or, or a decentralized autonomous corporation. So a DAC is a subset of a DAO. And if we dive deeper on what a DAC can truly be, is it's kind of like DAO is like a Twitter. Everyone has equal say. Everyone can, can do whatever that they need to do to communicate. And everyone's voice is treated equally. Of course, you know, you have more followers and whatnot. You have more retweets. And your voice is more impacted. But in this case, a DAO structure is more like Twitter. A DAC structure, on the other hand, is more like Discord. There's role and permission based, and it's open and transparent. So Discord, I mean, can, you can make any sort of changes. You can make it so that you know, it, it, people can not see like, specific channels. You can set specific roles and permissions to give you more access to different types of content. Another version is just that a DAO is like a flat organization, while a DAC is more of a tall organization. So a decentralized autonomous corporation is a legal entity which has a defined owner or group of owners which are responsible for the operation of the entity. Now I'll go into this definition, but I'm unfortunately limited on time. I want to describe what a DAC would look like in terms of METIs. First is access permissions. You have access to specific smart contracts. You can specify who can call functions. You can specify who can make transactions. You can specify who can modify the smart contracts. There's also a data storage layer giving access to specific users that might need more sensitive information while still operating in a decentralized format. There's also management capabilities, governance. You can assign voting power. You can get to choose how much control you want to give to a specific set of people. You can do it from fully DAO governed. Anyone has any type of access and permissions to a fully permissioned system where only specific users or addresses can have these types of permissions, can make sort of changes. You also have a management framework that includes payroll, finance, administration, investments, communication, reputation, and much more capabilities. You also have organizational templates. Again, all organizations are different, and the, the goal of a decentralized autonomous corporation is to give users the volition, the choice, the choice to choose to have an organization which appeals to them, that they can construct of their own. Just a brief look at the reputation power architecture that Metis has developed. Specifically, think of it as a LinkedIn profile attached to your address. You can go to different types of DACs, and you can go and participate in different types of roles. You might be a CTO, you might be a content contributor. You can do many different types of things. As long as they apply to the interface, all it is is that once you're introduced into the role, you get an addition to your NFT, and you can carry that around with you across different organizations. So instead of sitting three months into a specific DAO and trying to get you know, accustomed to all of the things, you can immediately show that you've participated in these different organizations. Finally, for scalability, we have a layer two optimistic rollup. So Mitis, is, Mitis Andromeda is a layer two optimistic rollup. We, basically offset, offload the computation while, while still being secured by the Ethereum layer one, uh, faster, which leads to faster and cheaper transactions. And what new that we introduce is the multiple chain architecture, 
which allow permissions to be set per, on a per chain basis. And you have the ability to set specific amounts of permissions for your chains. So in summary, we took a look at the community decision-making system, so the DAO and Steam, how both of them, even though they're protocol level, it was the community that came and made that decision, that came and made that change to fork it. And eventually for the better, we saw that the, it, it led to a good result. There was also a description, we also talked about a description of what DAOs are, as well as some alternatives to coin governance. In this case, we picked trust. There's also a redefinition of the decentralized autonomous corporation and how that might look like. And we also described the METIS decentralized autonomous corporation. So this is the uh, <laughs> end of the presentation, but thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I guess I might have time for, for a couple of questions.